I'm Rick DeHaut. I'm the Farm Financial Specialist with Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. Uh, I've been with the department now for three and a half years and prior to that I worked for a major agricultural lender uh, helping people solve their problems and meet their financial goals. So my passion is, is basically how, how can you make a living and is there enough money to make a living and, and is there a little bit left over that you can invest so that you can have a good retirement and do the things that you want. So have you considered leasing? Cows and pasture. Um, we know that in the last five years, the grain industry has been pretty profitable. The last two years, the beef industry has been pretty profitable. And we've seen land prices appreciate and cow prices appreciate. So the, the barrier to entry for most beginning farmers or young producers that are expanding their operation is capital. And it just seems when you're starting, there's not enough money to go around for everything you want to do. So one of the things that, that uh, Brian said this morning is re take a look at, at the model. See, is there a different model that can help you uh, utilize all your resources so that you have the ability to, to make a little bit of profit and have a little better living. So what, some of the things that we're considering is, is leasing cows and pasture. So we know that land prices in Alberta have really gone up. Um, right in this corridor where you guys are at, we're looking at probably in that five, four pasture, four to seven thousand dollars an acre. That's a lot of money. In the last five years, we've seen land prices in Alberta from Farm Credit Canada survey go up around 58 percent, an average about nine percent per year. And we've seen that land prices since 1992, there's been a positive correlation and if, if you were a, an investor, land has been where it's at. We've seen this uh, annual income. So if land was worth a thousand dollars an acre, uh, basically in, in 1980, it dropped with the high interest rates in, the, in 86, 89. 92 is probably about the best time to buy land and ever since then it's been going up. So, you know, here, right here at, uh, in 19, in a, 89 is probably $600 an acre, and now we're probably looking at $3,200 an acre. So you can consider in the, in the county of Mountain View here, um, land prices are pretty strong, and it is a barrier for young people getting into agriculture. Also, we've seen is, you know, cow prices are pretty flat for a lot of years. Uh, in 2013, you know, you could be looking at $1,800, $1,000 to $1,800 with a good cow in that $1,400. And now, last week, uh, just looking at the auc major auction, auction marts around Alberta, some good, good cows were uh, as high there uh, in, uh, in early fall as $3,500, but they kind of come down to $3,000, and the average cow uh, right now is in, in that twenty four to twenty five hundred dollar range for a good cow. So when you take a look at that, that's that's a lot of money for a young person to get in and make a living running cows. From the farm financial survey, financial structure by average farm type from Stats Canada, this is back in 2013. This is the average farm in Alberta in those years. This is a beef farm. So you can see that they surveyed about 8,300 8, farms. The total assets were 2.5 million. Liabilities um, around three, uh, 363 uh, with net worth 2.2. We know with the price of cows going up and the price of land going up that this is probably closer to $3 million right now. We also saw that farm sales were in at $420,000 and uh, expenses around 375 with net fat farm income around 52000 and you know, from 2011, look at the, the dramatic increase because of the price of cattle. In the last couple of years, this farm income has gone, got a lot better. So finally, uh, the beef producers have been, been rewarded for their patience in the, probably the, the ten, 10 years from 2013, three to 2013, that they're kind of beat up. And they became low cost producers because they had to be if they wanted to stay in the business. So for young producers, we can see that if you want to go in the beef business, it's not for the faint of heart. A lot of capital is required. You take a look at, you know, not only if you buy the land and you buy the cows, 
is you need working capital because if you buy a cow and you, or a heifer and you breed her, it's nine months before, before she has a calf, another nine to 10 months before you sell that calf. So you're looking at 20 months that you have to feed and care for her and where do you get that working capital to do that? So there's some, some ways that we talk about, about leasing that can free up some of that cash that you have for other things. So, but before you take, consider leasing pasture and cows is you really got to know your own cost of production and what those costs are. Because you have to know what you can afford to pay to lease a cow and you have to know what you can afford to pay that, uh, for that pasture. What is your cost? So there's some, uh, Rand talked about the agri-profits program with Dale Khalil. You can go online to Alberta Agriculture and there's benchmarks that you can benchmark against your own. Of course, your numbers are the best. People often know their, their operating costs really well, but it's that, those fixed costs that they have a problem with because what is your, 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 uh, your depreciation on equipment? What's your investment on equipment? And we know that you can run up your fixed costs pretty quick uh, if, if you buy a $150,000 feeding tractor and a $60,000 baler and, and hay mine. So those things can really affect your costs and uh, you have to be diligent. So, you, you know, when you take a look at bedding and feed, you know, take a look at the costs. Some of the, what are, what are the major costs and, and how do you manage them? So pasture lease. We know that in this area especially, uh, there's a large capital investment associated with purchasing farmland and that, that leasing pasture is a good alternative to owning. We know that the majority of the grain farmers in Canada only own about 60% of their land and they rent 40% and that's how they lever up to meet those conditions. We know that there's a lot of producers here as, as, they, as your neighbors have aged and they've sold their cows, especially in the black soil zones, uh, they've ripped up some pastures or they've left some pastures because there's waste acres that they're not utilizing and possibly you can, you can, can get in there at a reasonable price to cut your feed costs down uh, and also for young farmers seeking uh, to land because really there's two things in a farm. You, there's the investment side where you invest into land and you look for a rate of return there and that's one business. Farmers kind of blend and then there's the operation of producing income, uh, producing crop, producing cattle and producing cash flow to create a profit. There's two different businesses. We put them together but when you take a look at it there's, there's two different sides because you don't need to own any land to be a farmer. Advantages for uh, the tenant can establish a business without tying up any capital. You can start uh, there. You can free up that equity and capital for purchasing cattle or, or making a down payment on cattle and paying for those operating capitals or equipment while they're doing it. And it allows the young producer to gain experience without making a big commitment. We know that if you decide to go into farming, it's a long-term career and a long-term investment. We just can't, you know, you can't get in and out. It's like you can't quit tomorrow. Uh, it's pretty hard to do that because you've got all these assets and all these stock and, and it just doesn't happen that way. I can quit my job, I can walk out of here, I can quit right now, but when you're gonna quit a farm, it's pretty tough because you've got a whole bunch of other commitments. Disadvantages for, um, of course, when you're rent renting land is there's lack of security to provide to the bank if you're trying to borrow any capital. There's no hard assets there that you own and there's lack of incentive to make uh, improvements. Uh, we know that when you're leasing pasture, especially now we've seen in the last couple of years when there was no money in it, uh, a lot of these are the seniors in that maybe pasture is available, the fences are 40 years old and falling down and you go to lease that pasture and you say, who's gonna spend, are you gonna pay for the $7,000 a mile and do the work to replace that fence? So if, if you're leasing it, if you got a long-term lease, then you might, and there's some agreement, you might be willing to invest that money into the lease or in the dugouts if you need water. But that's always, you know, you're not gonna do, or you might receive the pasture to make it more, more uh, profitable. But unless you don't have that great tenure, you don't know how much money you want to invest. So, you know, year to year lease is pretty tough to make an investment if you get a five or a 10, uh, depending what. Also, if you lease the land, if land appreciates, you don't, you don't take part in that investment equity, that, that appreciation. 
So things to consider when uh, you're looking at drawing up a pasture release. Uh, how much native, how much uh, developed pasture, what's the mix, how old's the stand, what kind of productivity it provides. You know, le leasing pasture is harder than renting grain land because grain land you can go, well, geez, it produces so much an acre and the market value is, is $45 an acre or, or you know, lease is 60 or $70 an acre, probably in some places here, $100 an acre. But for pasture, it's hard to determine because you've got to really know what the carrying capacity and what, what that land will provide. Also, who's going to provide the fencing and is it adequately fenced? And the biggest thing with cattle, you need water. Does that, that pasture have water or are you going to have to haul water to those cows or, or uh, make an agreement with, uh, with the fellow that maybe you can pump water from their well? So general terms and condition leases, uh, times, day, months, you know, with pasture lease, some of it is by the month, sometimes it's by the quarter. When are you going to review the lease, any amendments to the lease, binding on the heirs, if you're reading, leasing from somebody that's uh, a little senior, what if they pass away, do you still have that property if it's in your business plan? Uh, what if they sell it? Uh, how do you lock, it, lock that lease in? Right of entry for the landlord to inspect and make improvements. You know, if, if you, as a landlord, if you rent that land to another party, you have to have their permission to go in because you've, you've basically given their rights, your right to use that and operate that land. You just can't go in and leave the gate open uh, because you own them. You have to ask permission. I have a, <coughs> I own a property and I have a lady renting it and I have to ask her permission to go in and inspect it for insurance purposes. And I have to give her adequate notice. Pull clause, and um, Ted Nyberg uh, is here today, and he's kind of uh, been looking after pasture and, and a lot of things for Albert Arctral for a couple of years. And he reminded me that you have to have a, a pull clause because there's a, it's been important in the recent years, not only for the landlord, but the tenant, because if, if the, those cows aren't, and calves aren't putting any weight, you want to pull them. And, and how is that going to affect your lease, your lease payment? Also, if you're the landlord and they're grazing it down to a, a, a golf course and you're not going to have any grass next year to lease, then you might forgo a year's uh, income. So it's important to negotiate a pull clause on the condition of the pasture and the condition of the cattle. Stocking rates and capacity, uh, we can see that on this side, uh, they're going to start to pack a lunch from the blade of grass and they're looking pretty favorably here. And so basically when do you move those cattle and again that goes with the, uh, how many cows do you put on it. Stocking rate, I think most of you uh, have, know this, uh, average animal unit is a thousand pounds average weight per animal unit. This bull, uh, I've seen 1.5 to 1.25 a cow. and you have to know your stocking capacity, how many animal units. Ted reminded me that in Alberta, we kind of go on the Alberta uh, unit, and that's a cow-calf right around 13, 1,400 pounds. And that's how it's negotiated uh, in, in different areas. So there's a lot of other things in the pasture leases. Who inspects the fences? Who furnishes the labor for the repair? You, the landlord. Who uh, furnishes the material? Who supervises water? Uh, for the lab. you know, sometimes you might pay a five dollars more an animal unit to have a supervised lease where the landlord might be in the area and they make sure that everybody's in, they make sure the water's on, they put out the salt and mineral, or it might be an unsupervised lease. And those are the things that you have to put in when you negotiate it. You got who's going to count them and who's going to look after the stray animals? Who's going to call the vet? Those things all come in, you know, if you're, you're renting pasture 50 miles away, there's quite a bit of yardage for you to drive your diesel pickup there every day to check cows and give them water because you're looking an hour both ways and what's the fuel to do that? I know that there was uh, one of the gentlemen up by Ashmont, uh, he consolidated his operation because he finally sat down one day and looked at his diesel bill and figured out how many hours he was just going to check cows to make sure they had water. So he said, yeah, the pasture was cheap, but I was driving all over hell wearing out my diesel pickup. So rental calculation, there's per acre uh, of pasture. Uh, that one sometimes, uh, you know, depending on a developed or tame pasture, number of head of livestock, animal units per month of grazing, 
there's an income sharing on Creta Durban shares uh, percentage of gain. Sometimes we see this on uh, feeder cattle where you put so many cattle in, you weigh them in, and then you weigh them out, and then you share the, the increase in the amount of uh, <coughs> gain with the landlord. And then there's a market approach where you calculate a share and contribution. Uh, there's uh, pasture lease agreements with Saskatchewan agriculture, and uh, agriculture, Alberta agriculture also has, uh, no, we haven't got a lease agreement, but this is probably the best one that I found. So, uh, Ted and the good people at Ag Info Center, they, they, they collect custom rates and they collect uh, lease rates, and you can go on. Uh, if you go on Rope in the Web and type in custom rates leases, you can find the information that they collect. In 2014, they, 48 farmers were surveyed, and uh, the good people at Ag Info Center are always looking for information, so if you could share what you pay for pasture, they'd really appreciate it. But you can see that common in 2014 in the south was $30 an animal unit or a dollar a head a day, and central was 20 to $30 and north it was $20, $30. So we can see in 2014, probably, you know, if you said $30 an animal unit uh, on, on good pasture, you're probably right uh, across the province. And this year with the drought, we saw some of those prices go up because they thought you, you guys could pay a little more because the cattle prices were stronger. Or we've seen so much a quarter section per the, per the leasing season. Always get it in writing. Uh, a lease is, is as good as the two people that negotiate and they understand it. And my, my experience is people want to hear what they want to hear. And if you put it in writing, if there's a dispute later or a disagreement, you've got it down when you're both willing to negotiate on a fair and equitable matter. It stops a lot of problems. Uh, it stops a lot of court costs. So get it in writing. There's a lease agreement on the Saskatchewan covers a lot of those things. I would strongly suggest that you get it. And if, you, if you're more than one year, if you're going two or uh, three year lease, get it registered against the title and that'll protect you should the heirs or anybody decide to sell it, that your lease is still good for that. Especially when you're planning on having that pasture for those three years so that you have feed for your cattle. Cow lease. A successful lease has to be equitable both to the owner and the operator and not properly done and properly done it can be advantageous to both parties. Both have to accept some capital risk and both have to have a mutual trust and confidence in each other. Cow lease is a, is a, um, is a tough thing to negotiate. Uh, they're great when they work, but you gotta trust the person because the operator must convince the owner that they have the skills and the resources and integrity capable to manage those livestock. And the operator must be confident that the owner will deal fairly with them and not pull the cows halfway through the term. So advantage to the owner, uh, we see a lot of uh, our producers in the twilight of their careers. They spent their whole careers developing great herds they, through their choosing their, their mother stock and they've got some really good genetics and great animals. And it's kind of sad after doing it for 40, 50 years that all of a sudden you're gonna put them on a truck when you work so hard to develop a great herd. So there's a few people that, you know, maybe you've, there's a young person in the neighborhood that has the resources and has the gumptions to do the work that you can lease your cows to. This last year, if you sell all your calves, and uh, you haven't got any optional inventory adjustment, it, you might have one tax bill, big tax bill if you sell your cows now too. So it might be that for estate planning or for some other things, or maybe you just wanna stay in the business and don't keep owning those cows that you can find some young person with the ability and the resources that they might wanna lease your cows. Uh, we see a lot of the cow leases with, uh, in families. Uh, where mom and dad are, are, are phasing out and, and the son and daughter or daughter-in-law and son-in-law are coming back to the farm and they're looking over to take over the cow herd. They still want to be involved because they need a, a, a retirement income where they'll look at, at leasing cows. And it's a, it's a good way uh, 
if you got extra excess capacity, say like this year, I know there's been a few people uh, that had to sell cows because they didn't have the feed and pasture, but if they found somebody in another area where they could have put those cows, they might have been able to retain ownership till, the, till those, those, their pastures came back. Disadvantage to the owner is that, well, you don't know what you're going to get because you don't know what kind of comment you're going to get. Uh, most, you know, that's your bet. But you have to have some confidence, trust, and some due diligence. A few of you are in the feeder association, and you know that uh, when you put out feeder cattle, especially to, to uh, a new person in, in your feeder co-op, usually the supervisor will go out and see, do they have the knowledge, do they have the feed, do they have the water, so they can care for that, those, uh, those, those calves. And you have to do the same thing if you're going to put your cows on somebody's place. And it limits, but it does limit some options because, you know, say if cows are going up and you have an opportunity, you want to sell them, well, if you got them in a lease, uh, a one-year or five-year lease, you can't sell those cows because you've committed th those cows to that producer for that period. To the operator, it creates an income, and again, you know, you don't have to own everything to create an income, you can lease it. It's an effective way to use surplus feed and facilities. You know, a few people, if you can lease some pasture and you can get it at the right price, but you can, and you want to utilize all of it, maybe a good, rather than buying some feeders, maybe uh, you can buy some cows uh, or lease some cows with some good genetics and then you can keep those heifers back from those cows uh, after you make your payment to build your own herd over time. And it's an opportunity for a young person without a long commitment to get to test, do they want to actually run cows? Cows are hard work and you got to be passionate about, about going and checking them every day. It always seems the cows are on the middle of the road when you're in your Sunday best going to a wedding. And, uh, they're never on the road when you're in your dirty old pickup, or, but you have to have, it's a commitment. And again, access to good cattle and good genetics. You know, there might be an ability for some, some of you to, to pick up some access to some good cows that somebody spent a lifetime uh, breeding and, and getting into where they're pretty proud of their cow herd. Uh, Disadvantages to the operator, of course, you, have no, you don't own anything, so you can't provide the bank any security uh, if you need some money for operating. And if the cow price goes up, you don't really participate in any increase in the equity. Like say, uh, you know, 2012, 13, when cows were $1,400, $1,500 a piece, and now they're $2,400, you don't gain in that because you don't own them. So some factors when you're considering an equitable lease is the cost to be included, the cost of resources contributed by each party, what's the percentage, the quality of cattle that you're going to be looking after, the age, the breeding records, uh, method of valuing inputs, death loss, and how are they going to be shared. This is my uh, brother-in-law bringing their cows home. Uh, it's amazing when you always take out mineral and you know, some candy, some old oats, how the cows follow you home. So uh, they don't have a dog, they got this old red pickup. So common types of cow lease, there's a cash lease where you pay so many dollars per cow per annum. The operator basically accepts all the production and market risk because if you put 100 cows out and you get $400 a cow, you just cut them a check, uh, the owner for the you know, $400 a cow. Some leases are on a number of calves, so you get 35 calves out of those 100 cows. And some's a percentage share that's predetermined, uh, and per, on a percentage of revenue of share crafts. And that way, what happens is is you kind of share the market. And also, there's a flexible share lease that allocates revenue based on costs. The best lease, though, is a situation uh, for the situation depends on the amount of risk that the owner and the operator, the lesser lease, are willing to bear. So. Again, from Saskatchewan Agriculture, where I pulled their cow lease, uh, BC Agriculture uses the same thing, the same models used down in the States, uh, is we'll take a look at kind of doing a flexible cow lease. So there's quite a bit of assumptions here, like Ryan was uh, assuming on the cost of return. We'll say the average cow value is 2,500, replacement cow value is 2,800, and what we're doing is we're, we're looking at the ownership costs. A cull cow, say a dollar a pound, dollar five a pound, 
average bull is 4,500. Uh, average replacement bull is probably twice the steer. Uh, cull, cull, cull bull value, 2,800. Uh, from the, the cow calf survey, basically uh, the average was 24 cows per bull. Uh, cows in this herd, uh, basically you average eight years, bulls four, death loss in cows a bull, 1%. Calf, basically the death loss of calves was after you pull your open cows out and you put 100 bred cows in, uh, after they have their calves, if you get 100 cows, you might lose 7%. And this is again from the Western Cow Calf Survey. And interest rate of 5%. So when you look at this replacement value for costs, the replacement value is the 2,800 minus the call uh, value divided by the years of use. So each year that's about 175. Interest is 5% times the average call value. Death loss is the average call value times the death loss. For bulls, you take a look at the difference between replacement value and call value uh, divided by the number of cows. And that's about what it costs. Interest on that that value, $9 and death loss. So the total ownership for that cow uh, cost the owner is about $427 a year. So now we can take a look at those operating costs and this is where I said you gotta know your cost of production. So depending on, you know, in this case, I think we're kind of looking at 210 uh, uh, winter feeding days and here about 160 days of, of pasturing. Now depending on the mix, just like, uh, like um, Grant was saying will determine your costs, but who pays these veterinarian costs? Here the operator's all expensive. Here we're looking at basically insurance because the owner takes the, the insurance on the cows. So if you add that up uh, on, the, on the contribution costs, we're looking at about $25 for the owner and $5.69 for the operator. Back on the fixed costs, we have the ownership costs for the cow. The operator has some depreciation on equipment. So those are the fixed costs. Now there's some opportunity costs, the interest on the, on the cow, and we put the bull costs in here. So the total cost to the owner of that cow was 452. The total cost to the operator was 689. For total cost, about $1,100. The owner had about 39% of the cost in that, in that cow and 60%. So what they did is basically they shared the calf sale costs uh, 40%, 60%. So if you said a steer was about $1,500, uh, 500 pound steer, $3, 1,500, 450, a weight cat heifer, 275, two, is around 2,300 at average costs, say on a return calf, 1,368, death loss from the calves, $95. So the adjusted gross was around 1,200. You split up the expenses off on a proportionate basis, the profit per cow for the owner was about $50, and for the operator was 78. But you gotta remember that we put in the full cost of the unpaid labor that the operator put in, we put in the interest on the animals, so that was after all those costs. So, and that's, you know, you gotta know your costs, you gotta know uh, what, you gotta make some assumptions, and both parties have to be agreeable to it. So other things to consider in a cow lease, not only the payment is description of cattle, brand and arrival date. Uh, you know, uh, whose brand are they gonna carry? Uh, what kind of cows, what kind of age? Uh, when were they bred? Uh, you know, I saw a fellow pick up 300 cows on a cow lease and uh, first 200 came off in great condition. The last two pots came off. Uh, they were pretty sad. They were promised that they all bred uh, the first in May, but they they calved into November. So he had a rainbow of calf sizes. So you know when you get that, it's it's not good because nobody makes any money and and it's not fair. So also where are the cattle going to be kept and does the owner have the right to inspect and where breeding policy? Who provides the bull? and what kind of bull and what time do you put the, the bull in? Because that affects your weaning weights and that affects everybody's return. Herd health policy, what kind of herd health policy? Salt, mineral, uh, vaccination protocols. Veterinary expenses, who pays the vets? And then, uh, as we know, the average is about 11% call. Uh, who, who decides which calls are called in the fall 
and uh, what's the replacement policy. Most often people will suggest that you don't keep, you, you, the owner provides the replacements and he raises the replacements someplace else and puts them back in the herd to maintain that, that number. Other things to consider when drying up a cow lease is where the feed, water, and pasture, and care, death, loss, and strays, who bears the replacement, uh, replacement of the heifer agreement, uh, insurance of the breeding animal, who pays insurance. Again, we worked out how you can go on the division of income and terminating the lease and disputes because basically what if you're not happy with the cattle you get, if you're the operator, and what if you're the owner of the cattle and your cattle aren't being kept in the, in, to maintain their call value or their replacement, their, their value. And also disputes, put into your lease what happens if you disagree, how do you arbitrate that, and how do you make it fair to everybody. Always get it in writing because again, people hear what they want to hear and I'm old and I forget and I, my wife says I, I, I can always justify what I think I heard. So it, keep, it keeps a lot of the, keeps the business honest by getting into writing. Again, uh, where do you get information? Uh, through Alberta Agriculture, through our publications bank, you can get negotiating cow lease agreements, and it's got how to calculate different uh, payment arrangements and, and uh, share rates. Again, if you don't understand animal units, there's some information on our website, Rope in the Web. Uh, if you want to see uh, some good cow-calf lease agreements and pasture leaves, Saskatchewan Agriculture has put it. Uh, the beef industry is Western Canadian, and all the ministries do a good job of providing information. And Saskatchewan, and the Saskatchewan, British Columbia, in 2014, kind of took the best of everybody and put a guide for agricultural leases covering cows and pasture uh, in a document that they're posting. Thank you.